The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, this is Jennifer Schaaf coming to you live from Washington, D.C. Thanks for joining us in our government contracting webinar series. Uh, our full schedule of webinars can be found on our website under the webinar section, and they are all complimentary, they are all recorded, and you can find the full schedule there. This week, uh, we are covering today, uh, Eric Crucius is covering the Service Contract Act. Uh, at 1230 today, we have uh, rescheduled a webinar from last week on teaming and subcontracting. Uh, other topics this week include capability statements, the False Claims Act, and hub zone certification. A little bit about us, we are based in downtown Washington, D.C., providing various services for federal contractors, anything from market analysis reports, GSA schedules, 8A certification, uh, proposal writing, uh, compliance with your contracts, and additional services. Uh, we do host the webinars throughout the year, as well as networking events and seminars. You can find those all on our website or subscribe to our newsletter uh, on the website as well. A little bit about me here, uh, but more importantly, I'd rather dig into the topic today on Service Contract Act and uh, Eric Crucius will lead us through that. And Eric, thanks so much for joining us today. I will uh, turn the floor over to you and um, look forward to hearing your presentation today. Wonderful, Jennifer, thanks. And you can move on from my bio, that's perfectly fine. Um, and that's uh, a little bit about home tonight, the law firm that I work at, um, but getting to the content. Um, Service Contract Act is one of those um, areas in government contracting that's fairly complicated labor uh, laws are complicated, and when you add Service Contract Act to the mix, it's a, kind of a double whammy. So first one, just diving into the content, first one looking to see um, if you need to worry about the Service Contract Act, you should see whether the Service Contract Act is applicable to your contract. And it is applicable to your contract if the clause on which termination is in your contract. Pretty simple stuff. Um, some people, some folks are under the illusion that if their wage termination is only referenced, but not placed into the contract, that that um, means that the SCA is not part of the contract. But in fact, the wage termination, just a reference to the wage termination number is sufficient. And this is a little tip for folks. If you get a contract or have a proposal or have an RFP from the government where there's no clause under a wage termination in the um, contract and you're concerned because it looks like a service contract act contract, it's best to reach out to the agency and ask. Um, while DOL cannot enforce a non-service contract act contract, what they'll do in an investigation if somebody complains and there's no SCA clause in your contract, they'll launch the investigation. DOL will make a determination whether SCA is part of your con should be part of your contract or not, whether it was excluded in error by the agency. If they think it was excluded in error by the agency, what they'll do is they'll require the agency to put it into your contract retroactively and then you'll be responsible for the back wages and benefits. You, of course, can get that from the agency, but you'll have to float that uh, for some of the time. Uh, along the way. So to avoid all those hassles, um, reaching out to the agency and, and pushing them maybe to put the SCA clause and words termination in your contract is uh, is a good way to go. So if you do have SCA and you have to worry about it, um, these are the basic requirements um, that are, are, are applicable. Um, first requirement is wages according to wage termination or CBA, and that's the wage termination that we said would be in your contract. And there's another category of things that are provided to the employees, and those are benefits. And those are broken up into three categories, uh, health and welfare benefits, vacation, and sick leave, which we'll talk a little bit about more in a few minutes. Um, also, um, contractors are required to notify their employees that they're part of an SCA contract, what their, um, what their labor category is, how much they're going to get paid, et cetera. And the best way to do that usually is through a letter uh, from the company to the employee when they're on board. Um, that often doesn't happen, so it's um, sometimes good to kind of do that if it hasn't happened in the past when you have a new um, new modification or a new contract you're coming up to do that and use that as an excuse to send out those letters. Also, contractors must retain records for three plus years, but um, usually contractors have to retain records for a longer period of time for other reasons, so that's not usually an issue. So for the first requirement, wages, wages um, that are required to be paid um, are can be found in the appropriate wage termination or collective bargaining agreement. Um, and the common misnomer is that if there's a new wage termination out there that's put out by DOL or a new H&W rate, um, that you have to pay that immediately. In fact, you should not pay that as a contractor until the next 
until that wage termination is put into your contract. Only then, because for two reasons. One, you're not required to, so you're creating more work for yourself and you don't have to. And two, the agency will not, um, will probably not, I should say, um, give you a price adjustment for those new wages and benefits um, if you put them in advance of, of when it's in your contract. So it's important to wait until the agency puts that wage, new wage termination into your contract so you can get a price adjustment for those new wages and or benefits. And the wages in the wage termination, I should always mention, are for and not a ceiling. So the contractor is free to pay more than the wage termination amount that they so choose. And of course, correct mapping is essential. Mapping can be very complicated. And I always say it's more of an art than a science because you're mapping the labor categories between um, your internal labor categories, the, the, the um, agency's labor categories, and the DOL directory of occupations. And you may even have labor categories in the GSA schedule. So meshing those all together. And if you can't figure out which labor category it's in, uh, or there's not one that really meets, you may need to do a conformance request. The next category of requirements is benefits. And those three things that are, uh, and we're gonna talk about the new sick leave requirement in a few minutes, but benefits include the hourly H&W, uh, the vacation benefit, and the holiday benefit. Um, for H&W, taking them one by one, for there's two types I should mention of regular wage determination. There's an odd wage determination and an even one. The uh, odd ones have an odd number, and the even ones have an even number, so it's pretty, pretty simple. Um, if, if you have an odd wage termination, which a majority of them are, there are very few even ones out there, but it's important to still check, you have to pay H&W for every hour um, paid up to 40 hours for each employee on an employee by employee basis. If it's an even wage termination, it's one, it's the H&W must be paid for every hour worked and there's no maximum and that could be paid into a pool. So that way, if there are some employees that you're going to give more H&W to, you can do that essentially discriminate between the employees as far as who's going to get more H&W, uh, less maybe it's based on seniority or some other metric, as long as the pool has the right amount of H&W and is distributed properly. If there is a CBA, um, that will supplant the wage determination if it's applicable. That's for wages and for benefits. Um, moving on to vacation, vacation is awarded in annual buckets and it's tied to the employee's anniversary date. And when I say anniversary date, I mean the date that they have started with your company, whether in a commercial capacity or in a government contract, or the date they were the predecessor contractor if you've hired them on subsequently, um, no matter, um, if, as long as they're at the same federal facility doing similar work. So vacation can be hard to keep track of. So for vacation, that's a benefit. Uh, a common question I get, can I pay that out ahead of time? And yes, you can. So vacation the first year which is say you hire an employee and they're not, and they're a brand new employee, brand new to government contracting, brand new to you. Um, the first year you don't owe them any vacation time under just about every wage determination. Um, CBAs are a different story and that may have a different alternative arrangement. But for those employees that are being paid pursuant to a regular wage determination, the first year you're not, you don't owe the vacation time to the employee until, until that first anniversary happens. And some contractors will choose to prorate that in advance and, and allow workers to accumulate vacation ahead of time. Uh, in any instance, that bucket must be paid on an annual basis. Um, so whatever hasn't been given prior to that anniversary year must be given on that anniversary year. And that's just an allocation for that worker. And that vacation time then subsequently must be paid out before the next the first of whichever of these things happens first, the next anniversary date for the employee, the termination of the employment with the contractor, or a new contract or a new um, with the employee, whichever comes first. And vacation, I should mention, is prorated for part-time employees. Um, and we'll, we're going to have a discussion in a minute on what, how you treat part-time employees, but for vacation, it's prorated. Um, holidays are specified in each wage termination, and you as an employer can substitute different holidays, as long as you give the employees notice. I always give the example, if you have a, a contract to provide Santa Clauses on a military base, and December 25th is obviously a very popular time for Santa Clauses. So even though that's a date in the wage termination, that's a holiday, you can, upon hiring those Santa Clauses, say, hey, December 25th is a big holiday, so we're gonna give you December 26th off instead of December 25th, and that's permissible as long as you give the employees notice of that ahead of time. And for part-time employees, holidays are prorated by looking at the hour, hours work in the prior work week to the holiday. 
So some pitfalls to look at when dealing with uh, service contract at contracts. One, um, often problems arise in the prime sub uh, issues. The prime does not flow down the SCA clause properly down to the sub. The sub is not prepared to comply with the Service Contract Act. Um, you should know that according to the regulations, primes and subs are jointly and severally liable for issues with the Service Contract Act if it's a sub issue. Um, so primes should be vigilant about um, flowing down the SCA clause and wage determinations, informing the subs by email that uh, the SCA is applicable, maybe getting a certification in the subcontract agreement that the prime that the sub will comply with the Service Contract Act. Those are all good tips on ensuring sub compliance. And while DOL has the option of going after both, going after both the prime and the sub, they'll usually look to the party that's responsible for the for the SCA violation. If the prime has done everything they're supposed to do, they'll initially look to the sub. That being said, for instance, if the sub goes out of business before the prime can, before the DOL can collect the back wages, they will come to the prime for those back wages, even if the prime has done everything properly. Um, second point, uh, investigations should be taken seriously. Um, the, the service contract that carries a heavy um, penalty if it's not complied with. The government has the option of seeking a three-year department, and they do take that uh, that option with uh, between one and two dozen companies a year. So any kind of investigation must be taken seriously. The individuals who interact with DOL should be very friendly and courteous with them um, and uh, should provide information on a timely basis. It's also important to potentially have counsel that's helping you, even if they're not front-facing to DOL, who has knowledge of these issues, um, so that they can uh, guide you through the process. Because there are pitfalls during the process as well. For instance, investigators may make promises that they really can't make. They'll say, well, if you pay these back wages, we promise we won't seek to bar you, things like that. I've had um, clients previously, uh, before they hired, um, may have um, been uh, taken, taken for that ride. So just be very wary about what they promise, because oftentimes they can't promise what they do. Uh, another pitfall, temporary employees, part-time, 1099s, and full-time employees are all entitled to the same pay and benefits um, that, uh, as each other under the Service Contract Act. It's just with the, with the part-time, part-time, temporary, and 1099s, if they're not working 40 hours a week, those benefits and pay are prorated. Um, also, if you do have a CBA, make sure the CBA is given to the agency in plenty of time under the regulations, because if there, it's not the... Um, you may be obligated to pay those wages and benefits in the CBA, but the agency would not be obligated to pay those wages and benefits from the CBA, and that could be a very dangerous situation. And just uh, pretty much just about closing up with some new re SCA requirements um, to look for. There's a minimum wage of $10.20 an hour, which is supposed to advance automatically every year, um, and that is applicable to workers who are billing to a contract and those who are supporting a contract. And that could have a very broad meaning. For instance, if you have a worker who's supporting the contract part of the time, um, maybe doing accounting for the contract, but they aren't directly billing for the contract, um, they may be covered by this minimum wage as long as they spend a certain amount of time uh, supporting that contract. Second issue is non displacement of qualified workers, which requires contractors um, to give uh, offers of employment to the, um, the non-exempt SCA employees on the contract. Um, with some exceptions, those offers of employment have to be made. Um, it's kind of a, a, actually a tricky regulation to comply with sometimes. So um, just be on the lookout, there are exceptions to it. If you change in staffing plans, for instance, um, you're not obligated to necessarily give all the uh, qualified workers um, offers of employment. And there are a number of other carve-outs in the regulation. Um, for instance, if the worker is not qualified or if they, they're a full performer, that may, those may be excuses not to give workers an offer. But the burden is on the contractor to um, prove those allegations. So it should be in writing, and there should be ample proof before a, before a contractor does not give uh, the client to give an offer of employment to a worker. And finally, sick leave, which just uh, was effective January 1st of 2017, um, it's only applicable if the if the sick leave provision was in the um, solicitation and now is in your contract, and it requires one hour of sick leave for every 30 hours worked for. Um, SCA and and exempt employees as well who are working on the contract or supporting the contract. So it's a wider breadth of employees who are covered by sick leave. I will say that for the SCA employees, the H and W rate is lower. This is something that's just came out from DOL a few weeks ago. We'll have a lower for I believe it's the end of July. You'll have a lower SCA rate for those employees who are covered by sick leave versus the ones who are not. So that's an additional burden of tracking that information. 
but uh, it's one hour for every 30 hours worked. And this interacts also with other, this of course interacts with other, um, other regulations and requirements. Um, so if you have other sick leave regulations that you're covered by, um, you have to comply with both and DLO doesn't really give much guidance on to which one, if they conflict, you should comply with, except to say you comply with the one that's more beneficial to the worker. Sometimes that's easier said than done. So those are the new FDA requirements. And uh, that's a, that's a, the lowdown on the Service Contract Act. Eric, thanks so much for sharing your time, your knowledge, and expertise on SCA. Uh, thanks to all the attendees for joining us. If you have additional questions about uh, Service Contract Act, please contact Eric. His phone number is listed there as well as his email. Uh, again, later today at 12.30, we're covering teaming and subcontracting, and this week we get into capability statements, False Claims Act, and the Hub Zone certification. Thanks again, everyone, and thanks again, Eric. Thank you.